What is up, family? You are listening to Living Beyond the Dream podcast, where we're having practical conversations to turn the dreams you have for your church and yourself into a reality. My name is Mike, joined by my man Tyler. We are so incredibly blessed you are with us. Thank you for taking a little bit of time out of, I know, your busy schedule to listen to this podcast week in and week out. Thank you for sharing. We've been getting a lot of love and feedback. Everybody sharing the podcast. It really does mean the world to us. If you haven't already put a review online, please do that because that really helps us get that reach out a little bit farther. But right now, we're in the middle of a three-part series on shattering church growth, which has been, I think, something I get a lot of questions from pastors all over about a lot of these topics, so we felt like let's take a little bit of time and really kind of dissect this, but before we jump into today's topic, let's kind of rewind and do a little refresher on what we discussed last week, because last week, a lot of pastors are asking, man, how do I even break that 200 barrier, because 80% of churches in America never reach that mark, so this is a very common situation, and a lot of pastors will see the few glitzy, glamorous churches online, and then they think they're inferior, or that they're on this island alone, but they need to realize, listen to me, they're not better, and there's lots of people in the place you're at, so we're going to work on growth, and we're going to talk about that, so we we need to understand this isn't a place to be embarrassed about, it's just a place we're going to see and attack and allow ourselves to have healthy implementations, I can't talk right now, to get us towards growth. So we talked about that very first thing you have to do is you have to have excellent weekend services. You need to have a Sunday experience that people want to invite people to. And that's the biggest misconception with a lot of people is they realize, hey, I can push up a lot of advertisements online, I can pump out all this stuff, but if you don't have a service that people don't want to invite their friends to, it doesn't matter how much advertising you do, it's not going to get people here, and excellence doesn't mean having a lot of equipment, and it doesn't mean having a lot of money, and it doesn't mean having the nicest things, it means making sure you're giving your absolute best and being prepared, making sure you've trained your people to be friendly and greeters and check in, making sure you have healthy a kids program that's fun, making sure that your worship team is practiced. You might not have the best sound system, yeah. but you can have a worship team that is practiced, practiced and re- prepared. Make sure you have great transitions that are smooth. Make sure the speakers are prepared. Make sure you are ac- uh, recognizing and expecting guests to be there and creating print materials and conversations and, and giving people these clear objectives of understanding we're so honored to have you here. We expected you to be here. All those things lead into a healthy church, which creates an excellent Sunday service that makes people want to invite them. So excellence doesn't mean money. Excellent means being a steward. And so that was a really important thing we talked about yeah. last week. So what are we tackling today, Tyler? Well, a cool story, if I if I can, real hit quick. It, hit it. So uh, in our seventh grade group last night, you know, we talk about one of the phrases that you say on a Sunday service is, you could be anywhere, but you choose to be here. And we talk about how that's just so impactful. Well, one of the youth actually said that that was so impactful to Come them on. and that that made them like invite other people because they wanted that same feeling. Come like, on. It was so powerful. That's awesome. So that, just, that just gives truth to what you're saying. That's so great. Awesome. Yeah. If you don't, if you want a little brush, you're basically every Sunday I go, man, we are so honored to have you here. And it, such a blessing. I'll say, I'm so honored to have you here. You could be anywhere. And the fact that you chose to spend your Sundays with us means the absolute world to us. And so, man, that so really impactful. blessed me. I love hearing that, man. Yeah. Because guess what? I'd rather hear that from a young person than yeah. I would an adult. No offense, adults. But man, because <laughs> if we can make a young person feel valuable in a, in a place where they feel bullied or insecure or inferior and they can feel like they matter, man, their future is so bright as a child of God. So man, yeah. that blesses me, man. Yeah. I love it. Come Good on. stuff. All right. So let's dive in. This week, uh, we are talking about clear next steps, breaking yes. 500 with clear next steps. So um, just to, to dive right in, can you define what you mean by clear next steps and, and why they're so important? Yeah, because here's what you're going to happen. You're going to, if once you break that 200 barrier, you're going to get a little bit of momentum. Yeah. People are going to start, you're going to start finding that you're going to grow a little bit faster because guess what? There's more people to invite. Yeah. So you're going to start seeing growth happen at a little bit faster rate than you did prior to 200 because there's not as many people to invite. Yeah. So you're going to start seeing almost that snowball effect where you start seeing growth happen as it gets down that hill. But the problem happens with a lot of churches why they never break through that 500 barrier is because there's these little bubbles that start creating inside your church. Mm -hmm. And these bubbles are basically the in crowd and the out crowd. Yeah. The doers and those that don't do, right? 
And what happens is, is you start seeing these little bubbles, these clicks, and they're not always done out of a negative reasoning, but this is just what naturally happens, that naturally forms. And so what you start seeing is the people that are on the out crowd, mm-hmm. those that don't do, start feeling like they don't really matter. Yeah. They start finding themselves falling through the cracks. They start thinking that it's impossible to get involved or get plugged in because they're not a part of the in crowd. Right. And what happens is, is that back door that you have in your church becomes pretty wide and people start exiting out that back door. Yeah. So you're not retaining any growth. And that's why you can never really see yourself break that 500 barrier. You might have moments where you feel like you're closing in on it and then you drop back down in size. Mm-hmm. And that's solely because you're finding yourself having too many clicks and not not enough inclusiveness of growth inside your organization. Yeah. So what Clear Next Steps does is it gives everybody on the same playing field. Okay. We're going to give everybody the opportunity to grow and progress in their faith, get plugged in and get involved in our church yeah. and start growing and becoming a disciple. That we don't have to make it difficult for you to grow, mm-hmm. but we're giving everybody the same opportunities. Now, you have to choose to follow those opportunities. It's still your choice, yeah. but we're giving everyone the opportunity and we're so clear with it which means that we communicate it so much everybody knows yeah we communicate it multiple times on a sunday we communicate it in every print material all our volunteers know exactly what those next yeah. steps are so when anybody's asking how do i do this or what what's next or where go we always have a plan for people they know those next steps it's communicated so frequently mm-hmm. everybody knows they matter yeah and they have opportunities yeah that's good. So to, to come up with any progression plan, mm-hmm. there all there obviously has to be like an end all mm-hmm. result that you're chasing after. How would you say you came up with your end all result? Well, a couple things. Well, the reality is is why we have these end all is because that's our calling mm-hmm. as believers yeah. in the church. Our calling is to make disciples. Right. Disciples are growing and progressing in their relationship with Jesus and in their ministry. Because of the relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Ministry is co- everyone's calling, mm-hmm. not just the pastor's calling. Yeah. And for too long, that was not what was uh, taught in the church or what was expressed in the church. For too long, what we pay the pastor to the ministry, and we sit back and we absorb what the mm-hmm. pastor teaches us, and we think that causes growth. And the reality is because for years, that's the culture of the church. Yeah. And it was the culture of the church because of something that was actually not done in a negative reason, but was just done because that's what was happening was back in 1611, something beautiful was formed, the King James Version Bible, yeah, which is wonderful. It was the main English translated scripture. Awesome. And for over 300 years, it was the only predominant English translated version of the Bible. But even through the 80s and 90s, the King James Version was all you used. Like when I grew up, you had a black leather King James Bible. If it was navy blue, it wasn't of God. It had to be a black leather King James Version Bible. Yeah. That was it. And it's a wonderful, it's rich, it's so meaty, it's great. Yeah. But it's a human translated it, mm-hmm. which means humans have human flaws or or sometimes we, we don't understand something or sometimes yeah. we do our interpretation of something. And there was a translation a few different places that were grammatically and translated incorrectly from the original text. Yeah. One of those was in Matthew uh, chapter 28 when Jesus says, Go and make all disciples. Go into the, all the nations and make disciples of all men, right? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son. Well, the actual translation in King James is, go therefore and teach all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, teaching is a part of making disciples, but teaching is not the only way to make disciples. But for years, that's the way we've thought growth happened spiritually. You sit back and you let somebody in a very Greek way, manner, in a very auditorium setting, teach you, you absorb, you go home, you come back to church, let someone teach you, you absorb, you go home. The problem with that is that's not the way we fully grow. It's one aspect of it, but it's just one aspect of it. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 that ministry is the pathway to maturity. That we reach the full maturity of who we are when we absorb the things of God and then we pour them out into the people around us. So we have to understand that making a disciple is when we take what we have learned 
and we apply it through ministry in our lives. So if we want to see our people growing as disciples, we've got to get them off the bench and into the game. We've got to get them on the field. We've got to get them using their hands and their feet. That's why Jesus says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you would give me. Right? And I was blessed by that. And, and the righteous people go, whoa, 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 whoa. When do we do that? We, when do we feed you? When do we? And he goes, no, 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 no. When you do this for someone else, you're doing it to me, which means when we serve, the presence of God is there in the midst. And so there's power in teaching our people the full aspects of being a disciple. So clear next steps is imperative mm-hmm. to see that. Now, how do you come up with that? Yes, That's a big question. Now, of course, when we first started, we were ARC trained. So we, man, we, Pastor Chris and, and, and them at Church of Highlands, we're grow leader uh, churches. We learned a lot from their next steps powerful things for years that's kind of the basis of what we did everything from we still have a lot of that similar language but over the years as i've grown god's really kind of i've seen a culture in our church that i've kind of expounded on that and years ago i read a book um probably about a year year and a half ago i read a book called no silver bullets by daniel m we'll put the link in the description uh, hopefully we remember because it's really good but he kind of pulled out a LifeWay research study they did with thousands of pastors years ago. And through this, they basically asked all these pastors, what are the attributes of a disciple? And it came down to eight attributes of a disciple, right? They had eight attributes, man. If you have these eight attributes, you're pretty much a growing disciple. It doesn't mean you're perfect. doesn't mean you're you know, the holy righteous. It doesn't mean if you only have six, you're a bad person. But they said these are eight attributes. Well, each attribute is kind of what Daniel calls it, an output goal. What's an output goal? That's your end result. That's what you want to look like at the end, right? It's kind of like, I want to weigh 145 pounds. You know, that's your output goal. But that doesn't really tell you how you're going to get to 145 pounds, right? Like, that's not how you're going to get to being a disciple. Because to reach the output goal, you have to have input goals, which means there's actions you do that produces the results, right? So that's the reality you got to understand. That's why there's spiritual disciplines we have. That's why Jesus talks about spiritual disciplines. That's why Paul and Peter talks about spiritual disciplines, because there's actions we as believers do that creates the output goal, right? So what would that be? Well, there's a whole list of them. Every single attribute has like four or five different actions you can do that would produce that result. Well, nobody's going to remember 30, you know, plus actions to do. So I sat down and I I got a whiteboard out and I wrote all the attributes of a disciple. And then I started writing all of the different actions. So I had this huge long list on one side and that eight on the other. So then I started doing these lines with different color markers. Everyone would go to different ones. And I started finding, and I found what are the ones, what are the attributes that actually cross off eight? So if you did four of them, what would you do if you did four of them that would actually cause you to grow in all eight of the attributes because we can't get people to remember 30 things but i can get them to remember four things yeah. and those four things are so i didn't make this up this is just kind of through the research and study is reading and studying the word of god yeah. that's the first one confessing your sins regularly is the second one praying for and inviting someone that's not in church that is unchurched is the third thing and the fourth thing is that you are serving in your local church yeah. That you're an active participant in the ministry of your church. Those are the four things that you have to do to kind of hit all eight. So then I started thinking, okay, we already kind of know our framework, right? Find Jesus, find freedom, find purpose, make a difference. Sounds really witty. Sounds really great. You know, rolls off the tongue, fine, 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 make a difference. Ah, boom, come on. But how can I implement that with those four actions in mind to create growth, right? The first one is to read and study the word of God, right? Regularly. Well, here's the thing. We want Sunday services to be a place where people find Jesus. Not only do we want it to be a place where every single Sunday we give people the opportunity to experience Jesus and, and give them the opportunity to accept Jesus in their life. That's why we create such an out, outward experience Sunday service in the fact that we want guests to feel comfortable coming in because they're on the outside coming into something new, and we want them to experience Jesus. But we also want people to fall in love with the Word of God and Jesus more deeply every single week. We want to preach the Word of God. We want to teach the Word of God. We want the presence of God to be felt right. Listen to me. People aren't going to be changed because I talk real good. They're going to be changed because they feel the presence of God. They feel the anointing of God. We pray for the anointing of God. And here's the thing you need to understand. Yes, you can get your phone and you can listen to all the greatest speakers in the world on the podcast, right? You can listen to every, you can go on YouTube so you have the best sermons in the world. But there's something about being in a church building 
that it's one of the few times you actually get 30 to 40 minutes of uninterrupted time of listening to the Word. Because, man, you're at home, you're trying to listen to podcasts, guess what? You know, you're thinking about your laundry, your kids come in and they're trying to interrupt you, right? Uh, 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 you got a, a, a project you need to work on. You're driving and listening in the car, all of a sudden you're getting distracted by that, or maybe you're, de- right? But the social media, Twitter's calling, right? You're grabbing that, whatever. But, man, when you're in church, most people are literally for 30 minutes have this uninterrupted time every single week to listen and absorb the Word of God because teaching is part of growth. So that's what we want on our Sundays, man. We want people to fall in love with Jesus. That's why we say attending church regularly is important. It's not an activity you go to. It is an important spiritual discipline. Secondly, we want people to find freedom, right? Well, you find freedom not because you absorb information. You find freedom because you're honest with other people. And so the second action was confess sins regularly. Well, James says that if you confess to your brothers, you are healed. Which is a crazy thought, because listen to me, the Bible says when you confess to God, you're saved, you're forgiven, right? And there's nothing you could do to earn that, right? Once you confess God, it's free gift, right? But there's a lot of Christians that have broken hearts and go into heaven. There's a lot of Christians still carrying on a lot of baggage in life. It's because they haven't understood this idea of confessing. They haven't understood this idea of authenticity and being raw and being real. Because they've believed the lie that people will condemn them. They believe the lie that people will hate them. They believe the lie that people will kick them out of church. They believe the lie and they've let shame carry them around. We've had lots of people that's dealt with some crazy things. I mean, some things that growing up in church, if someone would have done those things in our church, they would have completely been excommunicated. I mean, gone. They would have been hated on and, and judged and condemned and kicked out of the church. And yet we have had honest, real, no black, no gray area conversations with them. We've disciplined and corrected and but in a loving way, so much so that they never left our church. And people that are in their inner circles, because it's not public knowledge what these people have done, but on their inner circles that these people have talked to, go, I can't believe they stayed. Why have they stayed? Because guess what? When you can take shame out of the picture, freedom actually happens. See, here's what you don't understand. Those skeletons you keep in your closet, they're fed by shame. They grow with shame. But when you call them out with a group of believers that will encourage you and support you and be honest with you, you call them what they are, defeated, overcome, you're victorious, right? So what we've got to learn is to create this idea to get people in this community of confession, but you're not going to do that on a Sunday service. Where's the opportunity with thousands of people? So we've got to push for these small clusters of community, 8 to 12 people where we can have these real relationships to encourage and find freedom and literally discern and confess our struggles and confess what we don't understand and confess our doubts and confess our sins so that we can have healing. Not that we confess to get forgiven because God's forgiveness. Confess to have accountability. Confess to have encouragement. Confess to have people in your corner. Confess to have prayer partners. Confess to keep those skeletons out of the closet and expose them to the light of what they need to be because darkness feeds those things. So we understand that. The third action was what? The third action was you have to be praying for someone that's not a believer and inviting people. You need to understand you have a purpose. And your purpose in this world is to populate heaven and depopulate hell. Our purpose is to expand the kingdom of God. Our purpose is to be servants and selfless, not self-serving not to be living for ourselves and how much we can feed. So if we don't get our eyes off of ourselves and onto the world, we will never live with purpose. We will live for pleasure in mind. We will live for preferences in mind. We'll live for our priorities in mind. We'll never live for a life bigger than ourselves. We've got to teach people to see outward, not inward. So we've got to show people we don't exist to attend church. We are the church, right? And I tell this to all our our new um, people and our new members of our church. I say, if you want church to be all about you, you're probably not going to like it here. Because we exist for people that are far from Jesus that aren't here yet. So we're trying to get people to look out. And then the last is what? Serve. Take your gifts. Take your talents. Take your time. Offer it as a living sacrifice for Jesus and serve the local church and be a part of a movement that creates that progression in other people's lives. And when we can do that, the kingdom of God's going to expand and the church is going to grow. Yeah. That's good. So after you've got your progression plan in place, you know that the the steps that you want to mm-hmm. take, 
Um, you've created the content to, to take those steps. How can you identify a hole in the system? Well, what you need to understand is you've got to start looking for results. Yeah. Okay. You need to look for results. Okay. And results are very simple in the fact that are people attending life groups, mm-hmm. right? And and are people having healthy conversations in those life groups? Yeah. So are you checking in with people in those small group settings? Do people feel like you have a discipleship plan, right? Right. You need to check, are people starting to go through your new membership classes or your mm-hmm. next classes or your next step classes? Are they starting to get plugged in and start serving? And are they getting in those in those roles, right? Yeah. Are you starting to see a plethora of new guests coming, right? Are they coming? If, because if you don't have new guests coming, that means people aren't inviting and sharing right. and bringing people, right. right? So all of those are based on are you going to be real with your numbers? Mm-hmm. We don't measure numbers to pat ourselves on the back. Yeah. Right. And we don't measure numbers because we need to make ourselves feel more superior than what we are because a lot of times we're insecure and we think that numbers are going to make us feel something. We measure numbers to see how healthy are we, right? Are people coming to know Jesus every week? Are people bringing new guests every week? Yeah. Are we having people attend small groups? Are people getting in plugged in and start serving every single week? Do we have enough people? You know, those are the numbers we're checking because that shows are we getting people active? Yeah. And that's what we want. We want active people, not passive attenders. Yeah. And those are all measurables for that. Yeah. And if you have weak areas, you know where you're falling short in yeah. those next steps. That's good. Um, how, do you, how do you create buy-in on a process like this? Say you've got a four-step process or something like that. How do you create the buy-in to the congregation, and how do you prove its importance so that they will okay, there's a couple want things. to go through it? There's a couple things. Number one— you do that and that only. Yeah. We don't do anything else. Mm-hmm. We do those and those things only. We yeah. don't do anything else but those things. And so when they understand there's nothing else we're going to do, they understand that's it. Yeah. And this is either the church for them or not. Yeah. Secondly, we communicate it everywhere. Yeah. We communicate it right before we go into two-minute break before the sermon's mess. I communicate it after everybody experiences Jesus. I say, man, you found Jesus, but God ain't done with you. Yeah. He wants you to find freedom. He wants yep. to find purpose. He wants you to make a difference. We communicate it in when you receive Jesus. You get a next steps packet. We communicate it in our worship guides. What are the next steps? We talk about how you go through our membership class because in that membership class, we talk about it there and yeah. we explain why we do what we do. Everywhere you go on a Sunday, you're not going to ever walk out of a Sunday and ever not know what we do because yeah. we communicate it like crazy. And when we communicate it that much, guess what people think? It's important. Yeah. But – We also don't do anything extra. Mm -hmm. My job is not to fill your calendar. My job is to help God fill your heart. Right. So I'm going to only put what's important in your life. I'm not going to fill you with a bunch of stuff. And a lot of people, here's what you hate a lot. You'll get this a lot in churches, right? Hey, pastor, I see a great need we should do a ministry in, right? I got a great need that you, what they do, that you guys need to work on, right? Our church, what they're saying is, pastor, here's a need. I don't want to do any of the work. (laughs) You You do do it. it. (laughs) And guess what? I learned this from Pastor Lane Schranz at Church of the Highlands. He said it best. He goes, guess what? That's what life groups are for. Yeah. That's what small groups are for. We tell them, you know what? You don't have to stop doing your life to join a group. Yeah. You can let your life be your ministry. Yeah. And if that's your passion, start a life. Man, if you see a need in nursing homes, why don't your life group go and minister to nursing homes every single week? Right? And we empower the people to do the ministry. And they can build a group around like-minded people, right? Like some people are like, Pastor, we need to have some flags waving in worship, right? Okay, well, why don't you have a life group? (laughs) And then all you flag-waving friends, man, you love that flag wave? Man, have a life group where you just in the living room of your house, crank that worship music, and wave Wave. those flags, (laughs) right? Because you're probably not going to have a lot of people, but you might have a couple, yeah. and that's cool, right? Yeah. So what we try to do is we encourage people, take your passions, take your interest, take your life, yeah. and make it a ministry. That's good. I, I feel like the, the theme of Clear Next Steps is also a great avenue to take to make sure that all the congregation is on the same yes. page, right? Um, so do you think, culture, culture-wise, culture do you think that this plays a, a big part in the quality of serving? Like, does this, does this tie in to the excellent Sunday service that we put on? Well, yes, because here's what, okay, a couple things. You, I'm going to key, you kind of talk two things right here. Yeah. First off, unity is what changes the world. Come on. We can do anything when we do it together. Yeah. Nothing is impossible when we come together unified as a church, Mm -hmm. as a body of Christ. We're the body. Yeah. You always work better when your parts are working together. Yeah. You got a muscle spasm, guess what happens? You cramping up, 
you can't run right. Yeah. But when everything's working together, man, we're unified, we run really yeah. well. That's the way the body of Christ works. Yeah. So there's something powerful about the unity. So when you have everybody doing the same things on the same page, you get mo- movement. Yeah. But you got to be consistent with mm-hmm. it. And so consistency builds excellence. Consistency yeah. builds growth. Now, does it create this excellence in your culture? Here's why it does. Because I believe this with every ounce in me. We don't just have jobs that are fillers. Yeah. Every job is the same value as the job before it. Yeah. And the reason why is because we are working together for one goal. And here's what I tell people all the time. People make an impression of your church. And I might have mentioned this before on a podcast, within seven minutes. Mm-hmm. Seven minutes. That means they've made a decision whether they like your church before the worship ever started or sermons ever preached. Yeah. They've made a decision based on how cleanly facilities was. A lot of people think cleaning your facilities is a low job. No. Yeah. People, if you have gross, nasty facilities, they don't want to go to your church. Yeah. That's imperative to see people come to know Jesus, True. right? Some people think, oh, you only want me to hold a sign. I can't hold a guitar, so you just want me to hold a sign. No, you don't understand. People feel welcome and love, yeah. and their guards drop. That's yeah. imperative to see people know Jesus. Well, you just want me to check people in, kids in, right? Like, that's just like any. No, you don't understand. Parents are nervous to drop their kids yeah. off for the first time, and you're making them feel welcome, loved, and at home. Like, yeah. all of these things are so imperative to see people know Jesus, and when they understand, we need you like if you weren't there there would be such a huge hole in our church that would cause people to turn away then all of a sudden they realize what i'm doing matters yeah and they put honor to it yeah and they put excellence in it that's so good uh does this i want to talk about uh, again going off of the steps does this allow you to set boundaries in regards to recruiting like do you have any sort of uh stipulation that's like you know you've got one Step one, step two, step three, step four, and you can't do step two before you do one, and so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, and this or is well, does... every church is different. So you know, some churches are like, "Man, we ain't going to do any." Like, you want to serve, we gonna plug you in the next Sunday. Yeah. So there's not there's no right or wrong way. This is okay. That's your own opinion. Sure. What we do is anybody can join a life group at any time. Yeah. Or a mid size group, which mid size groups are larger life groups mm-hmm. that are twenty to fifty people that have no sign up. So people come and go. Yeah. No pressure to feel like, you know, oh my gosh, I'm scared to go into a group of eight. And those are open all the time. Anybody can join those anytime. Yeah. That's no issue. You can go to Sunday service anytime. But if you want to take that next step to start serving mm-hmm. at our church, we want you to go through a membership class. Yeah. And what we say at our church, membership is not political. Mm-hmm. This isn't anything about politics. It's all vision based. Yeah. We want you to understand really the heart the vision and why we do what we do at bloom yeah because when you understand that it doesn't become my church it becomes our church yeah and we want you to love the church you serve in right yeah and so and if you don't love our vision and you don't really agree with what we stand for why we do it which is not bad that's okay then you're not going to really serve effectively. You need to find a church that that's true in. So we want everybody to kind of know what we stand for. Yeah. This also keeps a lot of preferences and gossip and and why aren't you doing it this way? And it gets rid of some of that negativity because they realize, guess what? This is what we stand for. We're clear. We let They know our expectation. They yeah. know what we stand for. And because of that, we find that we get a lot more buy-in. And some people say, well, it's hard to get people to those classes, mm-hmm. right? Well, here's my thought on that. If you can't get people to go to two or three membership classes Mm -hmm. and they can't be consistent with that, then they're not going to be consistent in serving. Yeah. They're probably going to be flaky yeah. and those kind of people. So what this does, it also helps you weed out some people that aren't fully bought in. Now, not all churches do that, so it's not wrong if they do that, but that's what we do. That's our culture. And it kind of helps us keep a lot more consistency in our serving teams that way. That's that's really good. And honestly, this entire this entire podcast has been so powerful. And in closing, I just want to ask one more question. Yep. Real quick, speak to the existing leader that's out there right now. Is it too late for them to start? Of, of course not. It's not too late. I know for a fact that there's a church over 10,000 people that literally changed all their next steps and had all their existing members and serving teams go through a membership class and reshift it. All wow. people already part of it, and then starting new. So it's not to if a church of a large church of that multi site yeah. church can shift their next steps. Yeah. So can you. So let's let growth happen, man. Put those right places in, uh, in place Come so on. people can become growing disciples, getting closer to Jesus, who they were yeah. created 
to be. That's it. All right, church family, man, we've had a blast with you this week. Next week, we're tackling how to break that thousand barrier. Uh, it's a big one to break. It's a, a place that a lot of people think it's the promised land. I promise you it's not the promised land, but we're going to talk about how to get there because yeah. there is a lot of things that we can talk and discuss with. If you've been enjoying this podcast, make sure you subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe and also ring a ding that bell so you never miss a video again. And also, not only just share it with your friends, but please leave a review for us on yeah. the podcast. Really help us get that out there. Until next time, we pray God's peace.